Jim Doug, stand-up physicist, sitting down to give a whiteboard talk on non-locality in quantum mechanics. This kind of started out based on a tweet I read from Sean Carroll on November 8th. Einstein was not pleased with unpredictability. But what really bothered him was non-locality. And what he wanted above all was realism. Physics should describe what happened. (laughs) Not just what we measure. And I'm with Einstein. Well, I can see why non-locality bothered him. And not the probability thing, okay? (laughs) Because actually Einstein helped figure out why the sky is blue. (laughs) It has to do with a fourth order scattering uh, off of atoms in the atmosphere. He did figure out Brownian motion. And in fact, later on his career, his career, he brought in this idea about uh, emissions, which really kind of, as Sean Carroll kind of says in here, formalized in, in bringing in uh, unpredictability into quantum mechanics. And his paper in, what was it, 1932, the uh, really challenged uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics by saying, hey, there might be hidden variables here. And it was a long time before anybody could actually show, uh, come up with an idea to say that maybe that was wrong. Oh, okay. So let me see if I can explain this non-locality thing, because it's kind of a subtle thing. So they go and they measure things, spin up or spin down. And they have an apparatus uh, to do this. And if they're measuring spin up and their apparatus is like dead on, straight up, it's actually totally consistent with experimental tests. <laughs> so it's not wrong based on that. And if you go at 90 degrees, same story, all right? But if you do a bunch of experiments with the apparatus kind of in between, that's where the, um, the hidden variables hypothesis was shown to predict something different from quantum mechanics. That, that was only Bell in the, like the 60s so I said, you know, here's a way we could possibly challenge this idea. And then it took another like a decade or two and actually people are still working on refining this, this, this eff- effort because it's actually considerably subtle. Uh, and the experimentalists have just come up with a solid answer and that is the hidden uh, variable hypothesis is just absolutely wrong. Okay, but what does that kind of really mean. Okay, well, think about this. these measurements, all right? One is happening over here, okay, and another is happening over here. And the, when I say here and there, these things are fundamentally separated from each other. In other words, they've done a heck of a lot of very precise uh, hard work to show that there's no way that a photon would have the time um, to get over to that other one and say, hey, this is what you should be. So when we measure something that's distant from another measurement, it actually affects the odds that we can get the answer right. Because that's the way quantum mechanics is. It's non-local. And that's a deeply weird idea. And my interpretation of that is that we're still missing some kind of idea. Not that we're missing variables, although maybe we are in a way. (laughs) We'll get back to that in the end, I hope. All right, so what goes on in quantum mechanics? Well, what goes on in quantum mechanics is you work with the wave function and its conjugate, and you calculate... Uh, this sort of thing, and this will give you a uh, uh, the the probability. Uh, I don't know. We'll just say p uh, of an event at a particular location. Now, this is all pretty abstract machinery. L- let me just fr- write out a few terms of a wave function using complex numbers, because that's what everybody does. And so, the the ket thing goes 
A1 plus B1 uh, I. And because it doesn't do any harm, I'm going to just add a couple of zeros here. I'll fill those in later. <laughs> All right, so there are many states here. Uh, how many states depends on what you're looking at. But I can add zeros just for the fun. And I could be done or I could go to N or I could go to infinity numbers of, of, of these things. Um, great. And this is my bra thing. Okay. Then I got to form my cat. Kind of similar process. So A1 plus B1I plus my zeros. And then you put in a comma. And just so it doesn't get too crowded, I'm just going to write, well, okay. A2 plus B2I plus a zero plus a zero. And then dot, dot, dot. AN plus BNI plus zero plus zero. Now, this isn't quite enough for my bra over here. I have to take the conjugate of that, and that's going to flip the I, all right? So that when I multiply these together, <clears throat> I get A1 squared plus B1 squared plus um, A2 squared plus B2 squared plus dot, 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 AN squared plus BN squared. Oh, and I've got, I suppose I have those zeros, but you're probably not going to want me to write those either. <laughs> okay, so if you ever watch any of my other videos, you'll know, hey, isn't that the quaternions guy? And when he writes down that I, I bet he's just dying to write down a uh, J and a K. Okay, and that's what I've been doing. Uh, probably for over a year now, uh, I've been writing a C1 J and a D1 K. And as you you can imagine, I'm just going to spend a little bit of quality time removing my dear dear zeros and putting these in. And in a lot of ways, I want to be up front front and frank here. This is really dull work. So I want you to kind of be a part of how dull it is. It's like, okay, I, I, I get the uh, C, C1J and D1K, uh, C2J, D2K, and now we go to CNJ and DNK. Oh, and so now we get plus C1 squared plus D1 squared plus A2, ah, C2 squared and D2 squared and dot, dot, dot to CN squared and DN squared. Now, the way this sport is played, uh, I consider the answer wrong until I get exactly what I would have gotten unless I just get I in there. And so the details sometimes get a little tricky because the J and the K, they they kind of only exist to mess things up. <laughs> so, but if I'm careful, uh, and I, I can usually, no, not usually, so far, every time I've been able to come up with like exactly the same expression. So I test it by getting exactly what I expect, and therefore I don't get any new information. That's dull. But, hey, that's my life. So, why do I suddenly find this of interest? Okay, so think about what a conjugate means if you're dealing with complex numbers. I don't know what it means. <laughs> I can't tell you. Uh, it's a mystery to me. Okay. So, what about if it's uh, quaternion? Well, there I can tell you. 
okay? Because there, it's like part of physical reality, for me anyway. I'm always thinking about them as a finger snap, an event in space-time. So it has a time on my non-existent wristwatch and three dimensions of space. And so if all I'm doing with a conjugate is flipping three signs, then it'll have the same time and it'll have minus X, minus Y, and minus Z. Well, do we have experience with things that flip space? I was like, you bet, it's kind of commonplace. It's done with a mirror, all right? So what happens with a mirror? Well, you put an object on there, and this is this is actually Rudolph. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, that's Rudolph. And this is, if I can balance it, is quantum Rudolph. Okay, well, not really, but this is classical mirror reflection Rudolph. So what's happening? Well, in the plane of the mirror, nothing is. <laughs> X is still X, Y is still Y. It's just in the Z direction, well, what is plus Z is now minus Z. Okay? And that's why if you look at your hand, say my left hand in the mirror, then in the mirror it actually kind of looks like a right hand. It's kind of neat if you do that. Well, in quantum mechanics, what happens is that X goes to minus X, Y goes to minus Y, and Z goes to minus Z. It's kind of like this mirror shrinks down to a point, and then we would get the ref that kind of reflection. So you have to just have to imagine this, okay? I can't build a mirror that actually does this. It's, it's more of a math, math thing so that says, hey, this is what's going on operationally, and it's really similar to this, only Y and Z also get flipped around. Okay, but what the heck, why the heck are you doing that? Well, you see, in the Quaternion point of view, you don't say, hey, I got all these numbers and I'm all done. Mm-mm, mm-mm. You, you say, that's one of the four parts. You actually have two other, three other parts. That's the full result. And you better show me the full result, okay? Don't shortchange me, please. All right. But there's zeros, right? These are these are Easter eggs. Doesn't that make them really boring? <laughs> it's like, no. Remember, observers matter, okay? And how can you say that's an observer? Well, an observer sits in a particular location as far as they're concerned, okay? That particular location is zero, zero, zero. There's the center of their own universe. So I think what's going on in calculations in quantum mechanics is we're calculating a probability, that first number, for an observer to see something. Well, this all already brings up a host of other questions. Like, like aren't there like infinite many aren't there infinitely many observers of what's going on? It's like, yeah, you can put it anywhere. Everyone gets to be an observer. And as a matter of fact, this happens all the time in quantum mechanics. What you do, like say on an uh, interference sort of experiment, is that you say, oh, this is where it's most likely to see it. And then boom, we get that interference and we get like that. And we get nice symmetric sort of thing going on here and say, yeah, if you were here, you'd be very likely to see things. If you were over here, you were an observer here, well, you don't got no chance. <laughs> here you got a little bit of chance, no chance again. And we describe, in fact, not one observer, but a whole bunch of different observers. And so now, even though my machinery is turning out to be exactly the same as standard physics, I feel I can be way more at peace with the idea of non-locality. Take, for example, th think about a sphere of events and then putting a mirror, one of these point mirrors, like right near the center. Well, if you do that, then well, I, I, I know, we'll say events for each one of my fingers. And you go, hold it, aren't there mirror reflections going to be like, like close to this other fingers sort of things. 
And it's like, yeah, they will be close to each other. Well, won't that be strange? <laughs> it's like, absolutely it's going to be strange. This is quantum mechanics. We're not removing the strangeness. It's still strange. But now we're making it physical in a certain sense. We're saying that every calculation that's done in quantum mechanics necessarily uses a conjugate operator at some point. Now you say, well, hold it. The uh, uncertainty principle is just an inequality. But if you go and you look at how that's derived, you'll see at one point in that calculation that they actually need to take a conjugate to get up with uh, an inequality relationship that's, of course, at the core of, uh, of quantum mechanics. So every calculation, without exception, in quantum mechanics that makes an observation, that leads to an observation that you can go test, involves conjugates. And if you do it in using complex numbers, of course you can get a useful answer. But you'll be left with like, yeah, but what the heck's going on again? <laughs> and there you're going to be as stuck as Einstein was stuck so long ago, as, as Sean Carroll admitted to, to still being stuck. If you add the I and the, to the I, a J and a K, you're going to get the same result. I mean, that's the kind of game I'm playing. I'm getting the same result, but now I can be at peace with non-locality because I can say, hey, it's just 3D mirror reflections that you use in order to make a calculation for observers who are at zero, zero, zero in space. And then, boom, wow. No wonder quantum mechanics is so deeply weird. Uh, it involves mirrors everywhere. And in a certain way, you could say it is a hidden phase variable hypothesis. We always treat the phase as boring, as we should, okay? But we're not treating that boring thing correctly. It really needs a J and a K. And then you have a physical explanation, mirrors, as to why quantum mechanics is a deeply weird subject. All right, thank you very much.